Oh, thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mac. I'm an author. I think it's on, John. Is it on? Nope. Nope. Uh, my name is John. Wait, is that on? It's on. That's on, yeah. Cool. I'm John. I'm an author and illustrator. Ooh. Yep. C congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, John, I, I, I don't draw, so I've made, I've made some books uh, with other artists who aren't John. Uh, I did a book called Leo, A Ghost Story with Christian Robinson. Uh, Battle Bunny with John Sheska and Matthew Myers. Uh, oh No with Dan Santat. They are all, I love all those you really get around, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about you, John? What, what have you done without me? I've done very little. I've done three books uh, without you. That's not true. I've done a couple other ones. I've done The Dark with Lemony Snicket. Mm -hmm. I've done uh, 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 A House Held Up by Trees with Ted Kuzer. I've done three of my own, the hat ones that they, they mentioned before. But I'm pretty slow compared to you. I feel like when I'm working on a book that you've written, you've got like four other ones done by the time I'm finished illustrating it. It's actually really upsetting. <laughs> 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 but we thought tonight we would read you some of the books that we have made together. Uh, so we're going to start with our first book that we made together. Uh, yeah, and it's called Extra Yarn. Thank you so much. Yeah. Get this kid a mic. <laughs> John, you want to read this one? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, can you see? No. All right. <laughs> I was going to try and fake it, but I can't. All right. This is the first page of this book. On a cold afternoon in a cold little town where everywhere you looked was either the white of snow or the black of soot from chimneys, Annabelle found a box filled with yarn of every color. So she went home and knit herself a sweater. And when Annabelle was done, she had some extra yarn. So she knit a sweater for Mars, too. But there was still extra yarn. And when Annabelle and Mars went for a walk, Nate pointed and laughed and said, You two look ridiculous. You're just jealous, said Annabelle. No, I'm not, said Nate. But it turned out he was. <laughs> and even after she'd made a sweater for Nate and his dog and for herself and for Mars, she still had extra yarn. At school, Annabelle's classmates could not stop talking about her sweater. Quiet, shouted Mr. Norman. Quiet, everyone. Annabelle, that sweater of yours is a terrible distraction. I cannot teach with everyone turning around to look at you. Then I'll knit one for everyone, Annabelle said so they won't have to turn around. Impossible, said Mr. Norman, you can't. But it turned out she could, and she did, even for Mr. Norman. And when she was done, Annabelle still had extra yarn. So she knit sweaters for her mom and dad, and for Mr. Pendleton and Mrs. Pendleton, and for Dr. Palmer, and for little Lewis. She made sweaters for everyone except Mr. Crabtree, who never wore sweaters or even long pants and who would stand in his shorts with the snow up to his knees. No sweater for me, thanks, said Mr. Crabtree. So she made Mr. Crabtree a hat. And even then, Annabelle still had extra yarn. She made sweaters for all the dogs and all the cats and for other animals, too. Soon, people thought, soon Annabelle will run out of yarn. But it turned out she didn't. So Annabelle made sweaters for things that didn't even wear sweaters. Things began to change in that little town. I like to leave this one up a little longer because the drawing took a long time and Mac barely wrote anything. <laughs> no, we don't need to have an applause break. <laughs> it was almost starting. You ruined it. <laughs> All right. News spread of this remarkable girl who never ran out of yarn, and people came to visit from around the world to see all the sweaters and to shake Annabelle's hand. One day, an archduke who was very fond of clothes, sailed across the sea and demanded to see Annabelle. Mac, would you do the Archduke, please? Little girl, <laughs> said the Archduke. I would like to buy that miraculous box of yarn, and I'm willing to offer you one million dollars. No, thank you, said Annabelle, who was knitting a sweater for a pickup truck. <laughs> the Archduke's mustache twitched. Two million, he said. Annabelle shook her head. No, thanks. Ten million shouted the Archduke. Take it or leave it. Leave it, said Annabelle. I won't sell the yarn. And she didn't. So that night, the Archduke hired three robbers to break into Annabelle's house. 
and they stole the box, and they took it to the Archduke, who set off across the snow and sailed over the sea, back to his castle. The Archduke put on his favorite song and sat in his best chair. Then he took out the box, and he lifted its lid, and he looked inside. His mustache quivered. It shivered. It trembled. The Archduke hurled the box out the window and shouted, Little girl, I curse you with my family's curse. You will never be happy again. But. It turned out she was. And that's the end of Extra Yarn. Thank you. Uh, and then here's a book that we made together that came out last fall. We thought we'd share this one with you, too. We do a lot of books because they're really short, and we <laughs> can just blaze through them. This one is called The Wolf, the Duck, and the Mouse. I can, I got it. You've memorized these words? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Yeah, you know. <laughs> the Wolf, the Duck, and the Mouse by us. <laughs> Early one morning, a mouse met a wolf, and he was quickly gobbled up. John, will you be the mouse? <laughs> oh, whoa, said the mouse. Oh, me. Here I am, caught in the belly of the beast. I fear this is the end. Be quiet, someone shouted. I'm trying to sleep. The mouse shrieked. Who's there? <laughs> the lights were lit. A duck lay in bed. <laughs> well, said the duck. Oh, said the mouse. Is that all, asked the duck? It's the middle of the night. The mouse looked around. Well, out there, it's morning. It is, said the duck. It's so hard to tell. I do wish this belly had a window or two. In any case, breakfast. The meal was delicious. Where did you get jam? The mouse asked. And a tablecloth. <laughs> the duck munched a crust. You'd be surprised what you find inside of a wolf. It's nice, said the mouse. It's home, said the wolf, S said the duck. Whoops, sorry, that would be weird. Well, well, well. All right. <laughs> it's home, said the duck. <laughs> you live here? I live well. I may have been swallowed, but I have no intention of being eaten. <laughs> For lunch, they made soup. <laughs> the mouse cleared his throat. Do you miss the outside? I do not, said the duck. When I was outside, I was afraid every day wolves would swallow me up. In here, that's no worry. <laughs> the duck had a point. Can I stay? The mouse asked. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the duck said. This called for a dance. <laughs> As you can imagine, the wolf's stomach hurt. <laughs> oh, whoa, said the wolf. Oh, shame. Never have I felt such aching and pain. Surely it must have been something I ate. The duck shouted up. I have a cure. You do, said the wolf. Yes, an old remedy sure to settle your tummy. Eat a hunk of good cheese <laughs> and a flagon of wine and some beeswax candles. <laughs> that night they feasted. <laughs> the duck made a toast to the health of the wolf. But the wolf felt worse. I feel like I'll burst. It hurts just to move. A hunter heard the wolf moan. He fired a shot, but missed in the dark. Run, screamed the duck. Run for our lives. The wolf tried to escape, but the hunter pursued. The wolf tripped and was trapped in an old oak tree's roots. Oh, woe, said the duck. Oh, doom. What can we do? I fear this is the end. The mouse stood up. <laughs> we must fight. We must try. Tonight we ride to defend our home. Charge! <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'd like to pause <laughs> for effect. This took a long time. Oh, whoa, said the hunter. <laughs> oh, death. 
These woods are full of evil and wraiths. He fled from the forest and never returned. The wolf bowed down to the duck and the mouse. You saved my life when I thought not to spare yours. Ask a favor of me. I'll be glad to grant it. Well, you can guess what they asked for. <laughs> and that's why the wolf howls at the moon. Oh, whoa! Oh, whoa! Every night, he howls at the moon. Help me out, everybody. <laughs> that's the end of that story. But the reason we're here tonight is to talk about some shapes. Uh, we, we made this story last year. Uh, it is called Triangle. John, you want to read this one? Yeah, I'll read this one. I kind of shout this one for some reason. I haven't quite figured out why. It seems to scare the kids into submission, though. It's pretty good. <laughs> All right. So there's Triangle waving hello. You can wave back. You don't you have to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was the, no, that was right. That was the right yeah. impulse. Does yeah. any, we have an old enough crowd, I think, to remember Mario 2 for Nintendo. Remember when you picked the characters and they'd wave at you like that? That's what this is about. That's, that's the whole thing. Yeah, that explains that. All right. Triangle by us. And there's a copyright page I'm very proud of. This is Triangle. This is Triangle's house. This is Triangle in his house. And that is Triangle's door. One day, Triangle walked out his door and away from his house. He was going to play a sneaky trick on Square. He walked past small triangles and medium triangles and big triangles. He walked past shapes that weren't triangles anymore. They were shapes with no names. He walked until he got to a place where there were squares. Still thinking of his sneaky trick, he walked past big squares and medium squares and small squares until he got to Square's house. Now, said Triangle, I will play my sneaky trick. Triangle walked up to Square's door and said, hiss, hiss, just like a snake. Square was afraid of snakes. I oh, me, oh, my. <laughs> said Square. Go away, you snake. Leave my door. Hiss, said Triangle. Hiss, hiss. You, can, you were hissing before. You should hiss. Hiss. <laughs> oh, dear, 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 said Square. How many snakes are out there? Ten? Ten million? <laughs> Go away, snakes. Triangle could not hiss anymore. He was laughing too hard. Triangle, said Square. Is that you? Yes, said Triangle. I know you are afraid of snakes. I have played a sneaky trick on you. <laughs> Square ran after Triangle past small squares and medium squares and big squares. He ran past the shapes with no names, past the big triangles and medium triangles and small triangles, up to Triangle's house and right through his door. Almost. <laughs> you are stuck, Triangle laughed and laughed. Then he stopped. Sorry, the font just changed. I think it's Windows and it's really messing me up. <laughs> Triangle was afraid, of, his house was all dark. Triangle was afraid of the dark. It's too dark, said Triangle. You're blocking my light. Go away, you block. Leave my door. It was Square's turn to laugh. I know you are afraid of the dark. Now I have played a sneaky trick on you. You see, Triangle? This was my plan all along. <laughs> but do you really believe him? We got the font back, too, yeah. in the end. Yeah. yeah, that's the end of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one more book to show you. But before we do that, uh, we just thought we'd take a little break and see if anybody has any questions for us about any of the books we just read, uh, making books. We have a microphone here, uh, why we made them the way we did, books in general, being an author or being an author illustrator. Feeling pretty authoritative in this <laughs> director's chair, I have to say. Uh, so yeah, we have a mic and just feel free to raise your hand and, and we will do our best to answer whatever you want to know. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> Hi. So I'm just wondering what your creative process is like. Um, do you, uh, do you tell him what you're writing as you're writing it, and then you think of the illustrations as it goes along? Every book that John and I have done works a little differently. Um, and John and I work together differently than most authors and illustrators. We're actually not supposed to talk to each other while we are making a book. The author and the illustrator are supposed to channel all messages through our editor. Um, but we don't really do it that way. Um, <laughs> We She's not here. So yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> she knows, I think, <laughs> by now. Um, so for Extra Yarn, that story started with an image that John made in college of a girl walking her dog wearing matching sweaters. And um, I dragged that to the desktop because I just save images that I like. Uh, and when I, I saw that, I it was called extrayarn.jpg. And I called it that. <laughs> and I was like, what a great title, Mac. And... Uh, and and that sort of inspired the first that got no. It was that one on the right, <laughs> <laughs> and that inspired the 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 first sort of few sentences of that story. Um, the wolf, the duck, and the mouse was made more traditionally, where I wrote the manuscript and then sent that. The publisher sent it to John, actually. I guess that you had already seen it because you see everything that I do, but um, everything. It was nice to get it again, though. <laughs> and then the shapes books we make really closely together, yeah. particularly Triangle. Yeah. Um, so every book is a little bit different, but no book works exactly like it should. It's a nice luxury. I think for an illustrator anyway, you get a manuscript from authors sometimes and you never meet or talk to the author ever. Even after the book is out, you have no idea if they liked what you did or anything. And Matt can tell me if he hates what I do, so it's nice. <laughs> yeah. It's Sounds great. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? There's yeah. one over here. Gonna hand off the microphone. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> there you go. Oh. I have the wolf, the duck, and the mouse. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a good question. Oh, it sounds like there's some great taste in your household. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. I'm glad. That's the question. All right, we like that. <laughs> we'll take it. Very good question. Yeah. All right, we got one. Oh. Uh, do you ever have any ideas that you think w children would love and adults would love, but you think would be too weird for a publisher? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and can, can you talk about that idea? <laughs> uh, I mean, that happens to me with almost every book that I put out. Uh, I work with a lot of different publishers, and, and usually the idea that I have is very different from the last book that I've written, and, and my editor will often be kind of confused and sometimes put off <laughs> by it. Uh, but if I send it out, it's because I, I like it enough that I do think it should be in the world. And so I will typically send it around to other editors until I find somebody who responds to it. And, and um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a little different with picture books, too, because they can be, they're sort of allowed to be weirder. You know, like a longer project, like a film or like a longer book or something, they have to be they have to have rules that sort of hold together for longer, where picture books can just completely fall apart at like 36 pages. If it's a 32-page book, it only has to hold for that long, and so it's different. It's almost like a song or something. You don't really have to understand it totally, and so I think there's more latitude for weirdness if it, if it lands in a way that you don't have to even explain to yourself. That's okay, and usually that's recognized for the most part. I didn't run into it much until I pitched a book between the two hat books that I did, I, I wrote another hat book, sort of, that I really liked, and it was really weird, and, uh, and they said, this is too weird, <laughs> can't do it. But now that I'm finished those ones, I want to repitch it. Like, I still like it. I still have my crush on it, and I still want to figure it out and do it. But it's, um, I think it depends on the context that you're doing it in, too. Like, if, if this, uh, the hat books by then, they, they, they wanted them to be this, this one kind of thing, and I had a different idea for what it, I wanted it to do, and so there was a big discussion about what it is. You can get into all these vague artistic discussions, and that's hard to win because no one really says anything definitive in them. Um, but it does, picture books can get so weird. Even the ones we remember being normal are so weird. Yeah, and ultimately, like, that's all you really have is, like, if you want to make this stuff, is the particularity of your point of view, and you want to make books that nobody else could make, uh, but that means that you'll probably confuse some set of people. And that's okay. 
It's just hard when those people get to decide whether or not to make your book. Yeah. Like if you read yeah. Go Dog Go recently, that book is so crazy and it's like a classic and it's so great, but no one can explain that book. It, it's why it works has no reason at all. Well, we'll get both of them. <laughs> We should have them suspended in the air above yep. the thing. I would love that. <laughs> Thank you. Does um, text ever change when the art or sketches come in? And also, um, is John's pagination ever different, like to punch up a joke or something, to isolate a joke than what mm -hmm. you had envisioned? Uh, text, my texts often change when the illustrations come in. I think they should. Uh, authors don't always get the chance to change their text in sketches or um, as roughs are coming in. And I think that's, what, that's bad. The story works completely differently. There are things that become irrelevant as soon as I see what John is doing or, or jokes that I would change. The, the relationship between text and image is the, is the primary driving engine of the picture book. Uh, and it has to be so finely calibrated. Uh, so I always take that opportunity and, and it, it changes a lot. Pagination, yeah, I mean, I really Put I put a lot of page turns. I put more page turns than are possible probably into my manuscripts. Yeah, Mac writes it. I think for me, did you pa did you page out um, extra yarn? Do you remember cutting it at that? No, I I, I mean I had page breaks in there. I write two page turns, but like you wouldn't be able to put every page turn I wanted into the book. So John John is actually reducing the number of page turns I have typically. There was one part that's worth thought with extra yarn where the Archduke shows up. Yeah, that's so up. true. Yeah, um, yeah. The, uh, in extra yarn, when the Archduke shows up for the first time, um, the paragraph goes like, news spread of this girl and everyone comes to see her. And that's, that's a page, right? And so the Arch on the Archduke, who is very fond of clothes, shows up. That should probably be a page turn. This was, this was like the weird thing in this book that the editor didn't even want in this book. Uh, the Archduke's arrival, kind of <laughs> suddenly in the middle of the story. I mean, the book is, a much more boring book is over on this page, yes. right? Where everyone's so happy about this town that got covered in yarn, and that's the end of a, of a worse book. This Archduke comes out of nowhere. Uh, we don't really have any clues about what era we're living in yet. We've been, I've tried really hard to, like, make it generic as possible, and, like, really, you know, there's not, there's maybe Eastern Europe, I don't know, maybe but upsta he arri he arrives upstate New York, I don't, like, it, it could be, it could be Buffalo, like, I think, probably, but, like, until now, we've got no clues, and then this Archduke just throws a grenade into all that work. Um, and then a pickup truck shows up shortly but afterwards. It's, but yeah. also, I really like how he thinks a lot of himself to, like, have this flag and everything, but we don't give him that entrance. He has to hang out in the back and be like, I've arrived, and you can barely hear that he said that. And like, I like sort of taking that stage away from him, and so he doesn't get to really show up until But we this both page. assumed that he would arrive over the course of a page turn, and I think one of the smartest things John did was <laughs> change that and, and put it over the course of a spread. Um, just just, just yeah. because it's so abrupt, uh, that, that it still has all the impact and all the surprise, and you need, you actually need this to be sort of more gently incorporated visually. Into it happens what's going in the on. wolf book too, I think. Later on, when the hunter shows up and yep. the wolf is sick on the ground because everyone's dancing around inside of him, and then this hunter's just there. You turn the page and you read the first sentence, and you're like, "Who is the guy in the corner?" And we don't Today mention a kid, him. Today, kid, we turn this page turn, and a kid just goes, "It's Santa!" <laughs> <laughs> so that was exciting. Ugh. Yeah. I think that like the, the idea for this book, for the wolf book, was that it was sort of like a play being put on on like an elementary school stage. All the trees are like really, you know, it's not more than four feet deep, and so it has that feeling. Everyone's shouting their lines when they're not supposed to, and um, and the idea for the hunter was that like he shows up, like he's so excited to be in this book that he's like, "Can I come in now? Can I? Is this okay? Play? Can I stand here?" And you're like, "You're not, it's not okay. Fine. You're just now you're in the book. Fine. You can be there." He's like, "All right, I'm gonna be here." And like we just didn't have enough pages to spread it out that way. You don't really want to anyway. I don't want to draw a whole spread of a wolf being sick. And so we can put him in there. But I love how he comes in early. Um, but yeah, that's another thing where you sort of so That was probably a page turn when you yep, wrote it. Right. So you can have fun with it, but it's also like, I wouldn't want to do it if Mac was like, you messed it up. Yeah. 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 I like it. Hi, uh, I just wanted to know what are some of your influences of like modern and contemporary illustrators and um, authors as well as classic picture book illustrators and authors? 
Um, contemporary ones. There's a there's a a book by this guy named Wolf Elbrook called the du Deck. I always mess it up. Duck, Duck Death, Death, and, and the, the tulip. tulip. Yeah, and it's really great. Someone gave that to me as a present, and it's like the angel of death taking a duck and like sending him on his way. By the way, I gave it to him as a present. You did not. Somebody. No, you didn't. Somebody. Well, then you got two no. because I did give you that as a present. You were late. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I found it at a bookstore by myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it was, it, I just, uh, it was really inspiring because it had this really kind of deep, dark thing, but it was done so gently. And I think that it was so inspiring to see that you can do almost anything if you do it gently or if you do it with care. And it's not the story or the events in the book, but it's the staging of that. It's this, it's how you're introducing it to the audience. Th I think th that's misunderstood a lot, where they're like, well, literally, someone's murdered in this book. You're like, yeah, but how? I, like, how is it done? How do we do this? That was, that was a really big book. Um, there's a lot of great people working now. There's so many people. Um, Laura Carlin over in the UK is doing amazing stuff. Uh, Sydney Smith is up in Canada doing crazy good work. Uh, who else? Um, I can never pronounce her name. Uh, Beatrice Alamana. Alamana. Yeah, yeah, she's from France, and she's really, really good. Um, some people in the room who I won't call out for fear of embarrassing them, but they're making me nervous as I speak. Um, yeah, it's a really fun time in picture books right now because I feel like a lot of young people came into it after they weren't in, in it for a while, and it's been really a blast to be in it for the last couple of years. I think there was like a... There was, there was 2009, maybe, there was an article in the New York Times front page that, that said the picture book as an art form was dead. Um, that was the first year I started working in picture books. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that publishers were moving away from it, people weren't interested in them, people weren't buying them. And so I think that the people who got into picture books in the last nine years are people who really cared about them. Uh, despite all of the warning signs to the contrary, they went in anyway, and there's just been such a talented crop of people. Um, Carson Ellis, Christian Robinson, Tao Nyu, uh, yeah, and then as, as for like classics, um, Margot Wise Brown is huge for me, Maurice Sendak, James Marshall. I didn't get to do classics, I didn't know he got to do classics. Uh, Donald Cruz is like, I think, such a genius at wringing emotion out of concept books. Um, Lobel. Lobel. Uh, uh, the reason I started writing picture books uh, was a picture book called The Stinky Cheese Man by John Sheska. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a big book for me, too. I think uh, that was the first time, I think we've talked about this, where we saw, like, there's something in that book that we try for a little bit where it's like you want them to feel like you were having fun when you made it. It was one of the first books where you're like, these guys are having a blast, and this is so fun. And you're laughing partly because it's so funny, but also because you feel like they're sitting next to you giggling as you're reading it. Like, there was a presence to it that we still, I think the two of us really, like, uh, we, we strive for, where you just, like, you want to be just sitting next to them and be like, eh? Eh, it's pretty funny, right? That's pretty good. <laughs> and, like, that kind of dynamic is, is still a big part of the work, for sure. We have one more here. Yeah. Um, the type is so pretty in all of your books. Do you lay it out? I do lay it out. I, I'm sort of, yeah, that font change and, and the shapes one really, like, truly went deep down into my soul. I didn't like it at all. Um, I don't vary too much. I don't think I get too adventurous with, with fonts, as well, interior type anyway. I think that the main thing I want it to feel is just warm and accessible. Most of the book design is meant to feel like if you open the book at any page, you're not going to get overwhelmed and close it. If you're, like, in second grade and you're like, well, uh, that's too much stuff. And so the type has to do that and... I think early on, the first few books I did, I sort of, I didn't have control over the type. And I didn't know what I was supposed to be, like, I want to draw to where the type's going to go. It's not like an afterthought. You don't just rub away a corner of the illustration and be like, well, you can, it'll fit. We'll, we'll kern it or something. And it's just like, no, no, no. And so I always try and make it so that they're forced to put it somewhere. Like, they need, if, the, if someone's going to put my type somewhere, they have to put it to the inch where I want it to go. And for all the covers, I like drawing letters, but I think I like the control of drawing letters more than I even like drawing letters. Like, after you do a cover, I can't believe I'm telling you that, but it's, uh, but it's like you just, uh, you do a cover and someone rearranges your type, it's not your book anymore. And it's like, I don't know exactly how to draw the letters, but I can draw it better than that. I can approximate it. And there's something about the approximation that's even got some warmth to it, because you're not, you don't get it right on, you, you, you try for the straight and it, 
you know, it does this. And you're like, that's great. That's what I want. I want it to be warm and like feel like I touched it. And so, yeah, I always, um, I think my art directors get a little frustrated because that's supposed to be their job and I always do it first. And I let them kind of clean it up because I'm sort of intimidated by actual graphic design, capital G and D. But I always, you choose the fonts and you lay it out. You basically put them where you want it. And if they say, well, that shouldn't quite be that way, then you let them nudge it. But only nudging, that's, yeah, that's the rule. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, um, please take the stickers off the front. That wasn't my idea and they said we needed them. Yeah. So please take those stickers off. Uh, what advice do you have for people who wants to be an author, an illustrator? I would say just read all the time. Read picture books, see what people are doing in them, read all kinds of books, be engaged in what's happening in, in literature. And, and the more you read, the better you get. And the picture book is a, such a peculiar form. There are things and ways that you tell stories that are different from any other way to tell a story. So just keeping an eye on, on the history of the picture book, it's so young, it's, it's, it's only been around in its modern form for about 100 years. Uh, and, and taking a look at what people are doing now, just really, really getting comfortable with all the variety that, that's out there and that'll be the pathway to all the variety that's still possible. I would say too, I don't know if you meant creatively or professionally, but um, creatively, I'm the worst at this and so it seems like good advice is don't hold too tight to what you're making because this is such a, like, people have such a romance about picture books because you grew up with them and they have this hazy memory of these beautiful books that they looked at and everything. And so when you start to make them, you're like, I have to live up to all of that. I'm putting something in that world and you just freeze up. And so learning how not to freeze up and learning to take it loosely and sort of relax because even the ones you loved were done, you look back and they're very simple and there's very, there's a lot, there's a lot more and there's a lot less at the same time and you realize that like loosening up really helps you out and so finding ways of doing that for your own self. I go ages frozen up because I want to try something that I feel like, um, I don't know, it just intimidates you all over again. Books are just so great. You think, what am I doing making a book? Who the heck am I? And then you do it every time but if you can find ways around that, that's the best thing. Should we do one more and then read Square? Oh yeah, right, right. yeah. Yep. Do one more. Yeah, Square to read. Yeah. Um, what kind of uh, digital editing do you do to your uh, illustrations? Too much. I do, um, I've tried to do less and less as it goes. I started in animation, so I wasn't taught how to paint or do it. Like, I was just used to drawing. We were just drawing all the time with just pencils. And so um, with this stuff, I try and, most books are kind of an excuse to try a different medium um, to see if I can learn something from it. Like The Wolf and the Duck, it was these weird crayons that uh, turn into watercolor and mixed with like graphite powder to give you this stuff. But I knew I wanted a bunch of texture in it, but um, you just change it up for this book and it kind of suited the inside of a wolf's stomach. Um, and then for uh, extra yarn, it was a lot of, uh, it was very digital actually, except for the, the yarn itself was a sweater that I got from the Goodwill and scanned, it was black and white. I couldn't draw stitches, I thought I was going to, and then I just, it looked terrible. And so I scanned in this sweater and then colored it differently. But it's a real stitch, which helps because this book, we get a lot of knitters being like, oh, it's a real stitch. I have no idea what they mean. Oh, that's a real uh, stitch. Yeah. And those knitting needles are upside yeah. down. The thing, it's like, it's like <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, man, where is that? Yeah, so much hate mail from that drawing. It's, it's not how you hold knitting needles. I'm so sorry. Um, nice job on the stitches, but. But ruined all my capital. Um, but I do, I think that the, the main thing is to get a bunch of accidents before you get full control over it. And so, I try and extend the stage where there's a bunch of messy brush strokes and big broad work and then if I need to, usually the eyes are done, if not digitally, then somehow more carefully because they're the things that are really kind of forgiving all the messiness. If it's really loose, if the eyes are doing the right thing, you kind of forgive all of that because you're focused on what they're thinking and it's okay. Um, but I try, because it's printed on paper, you try and start on paper. That's just, it's not an ethos. I don't get romantic about it, but it does a design thing I think is, I don't, tr I don't try and start with photographs or even digital, your digital tricks kind of fall over when you print it for some reason. They look fine on the screen, then you get the proofs back and every, all your, tr you feel like you're in your underwear. It's awful. And so, um, yeah, as many broad, big, messy strokes at first and then you put it all together digitally and I can adjust the colors. I usually just go for noise first. If it's the wrong color, I don't care. It just, as long as the noise is what I want, then I, that's usually enough. So if you didn't get your question answered, we'll be signing books and please ask us then. Um, but uh, we are here actually because today our, our new book just came out. This is like the launch party. It was just published today. 
Uh, this is the first time it's been available at a bookstore. Yeah, you can applaud for that, not John's ridiculous. Oh no, there's no cover. Uh, we're gonna hear, you know, can I borrow your copy of this? <laughs> this today is, is uh, what is sometimes called this book's book birthday. <coughs> and I know what everybody's thinking. Uh, I didn't buy your book a birthday present. I didn't mail your book a birthday card. I never even sang happy birthday to your book. <laughs> I know. And the book knows too. In this situation right now, it's actually pretty awkward. <laughs> but we can fix this. Now, I don't know if everybody here has sung happy birthday to a book before. <laughs> but you don't just get to say happy birthday, dear book. No, that would be like if I was like happy birthday, dear person. That's rude. And I'm sorry if it's your birthday. <laughs> you have to say the book's full title. Happy, and this one is easy. Happy birthday, dear square. By Mac Barnett and John Clausen. <laughs> Published by Candlewick Press. A subsidiary of Walker Books International. <laughs> Copyright 2018. So I know that was kind of a lot, so just listen real closely, <laughs> and, and you can just repeat after me, so just listen very carefully. Happy birthday, Dear Square, by Mac Barnett and John Clausen, published by Candlewick Press, a subsidiary of Walker Books International, copyright 2018. Happy birthday, Square, by Mac Barnett and John Clausen, published by Candlewick Press, a subsidiary of Walker Books, copyright 2018. Perfect, I think we got it, yeah, great. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> everybody please take this note. Hmm. Now take this note. <laughs> John usually now tells me that that's the same note, it's but I don't yeah. believe him. <laughs> I don't think that was the same <laughs> note. <laughs> All right, now that we're in full voice. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear square. Mac Barnett and John Clausen, published by Candle with Press, a subsidiary of Walker Books and International, copyright 2018. Happy birthday to you. Very nice. Oh, beautiful. That was Thanks, beautiful. Guys. Thank you so much. All right, now here we go. Let's do it. I'm feeling good. The book's feeling good. How are you feeling, John? Yeah, I'm feeling ready to go. Good. There's square. Are you you can wave. This? You don't have to. I'll You're read gonna, it. Yeah, you yeah. Okay. All right, there's Square a title page. by us, yep. Candlewick Press, Walker Books International. <laughs> <laughs> this is Square. This is Square's secret cave. Oh, no! Uh-oh. I'm going to take this back again. Are you just going to read it? Yep. Okay. Sorry, PowerPoint was my job. Every day, Square goes down into his cave and takes a block from the pile below the ground. He pushes the block up and out of the cave. He brings the block to the pile at the top of the hill. This is his work. One day, while Square was doing his work, Circle floated by. Square, said Circle. <laughs> you are a genius. I did not know you were a sculptor. Ah, yes, said Square. What is a sculptor? A sculptor shapes blocks into art, said Circle. Ah, <laughs> yes, said Square. <laughs> I see what you mean. But he did not really see what she meant. This is a wonderful sculpture, said Circle. It looks just like you. Square looked at his block. Yes, I suppose it is wonderful. Now, said Circle, you must do one of me. Oh, said Square. I will come back for it tomorrow. Goodbye, genius. Circle, said Square. I think I should tell you something. <laughs> but she was already gone. Oh, dear, 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 said Square. He studied the block. I have to make this block look like circle. Circle is perfect. So I must make this perfect. Square got to work shaping the block. 
Oh, crumbs, said Square. This is not perfect. Oh, dirt, said Square. This is much worse. He went back to work. He worked and worked and worked and worked. Ah! <laughs> cried Square. He had carved the whole block away. There was nothing left. He was surrounded by rubble. Whatever is the opposite of perfect, that is what this is. I must stay up all night and figure this out. Square fell asleep. <laughs> the next morning, Square woke up wet. He despaired. What have I done? I push blocks. I do not shape them. I am not a genius. Hello, genius, said Circle. I am early. <laughs> oh, dear, whispered Square. Are you finished? asked Circle. Oh, yes, said Square. I'm finished. Circle peered down. Oh, my, she said. It was beautiful. It was beguiling. It is perfect, said Circle. It is? asked Square. Yes, said Circle. You are a genius, said Circle. But was he really? <laughs> <laughs> and that is the end of that That's story. That's the end of Square. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody.